Um, this week we're going to be looking at chapter 3 in the Christian Manifesto. But first let's open up in a word of prayer. Amen. Amen. Father, we just um, we come before you and we just thank you for this opportunity that you have provided for us. That we can gather together as your people, Lord, and we can take advantage of this resource that you have provided for us, Lord, just to have a, a better understanding of how you desire us to live as a people um, in society, in our communities, in this world, Lord, that we would continue to manifest your glory um, where, wherever it is that we're at, wherever it is that you give us a sphere of influence, Lord. And so we just thank you for this time. We ask that you would slow down our hearts and our minds, that we can receive the word that you have for us this morning, and that we would give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in the name of your precious, beloved Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. So um, I, w- I want to give a real quick recap of chapter 2, which we covered um, three weeks ago. And chapter 2 was titled, The Foundations for Faith and Freedom. And so the very last closing paragraph, Schaefer, he tells us to consider those men who were the founders of the United States and how they had a Christian worldview. He refers to it as Judeo-Christian worldview. And so that was something that would give us confidence and being able to trust their their premise of their their concepts of government and law. But he says it wasn't until this idea of materialistic, humanistic and choice worldview began to creep in that the Judeo Christians begin to lose their influence. And so then we lead into chapter three. And uh, chapter three is titled The Destruction of Faith and Freedom. And I like the way that he starts. He starts off chapter three. It's kind of like uh, it gets you excited to want to see what he has to say. He says, and now it is all gone. And so when I read that, I asked the question, I'm like, what, what is he referring to? What is all gone? But then, of course, I remembered back what we covered in Chapter two, he's referring to that Judeo Christian worldview and influence, which had set the premise for law and government. And so now he begins to talk about that we live in a secularized society, which refers to sociological law. And this is the way he explains it. He says, by sociological law, We mean a law that has no fixed base, but a law which which in which a group of people decides what is sociologically good for society at that given moment and what they decide becomes law. So we if we think about that explanation, it seems pretty scary to think about. Right. Think about that. A group of people would come together, says they had no base, whereas opposed to what we what we covered in chapter two, there was a base. It was the Judeo Christian worldview. So they had some sense of morality, right? Some sense of moral law that was the premise for their view where they built their concepts on that. But here it says in this particular view, there is no base. They would just refer to a group of people And these people would decide what was best at that moment, depending on what was going on around them. So it's kind of scary in the sense that that nothing is solid. Nothing is for sure. It would all it would always be fluctuating and shifting based on what was happening around society. So then he goes on and he gives us an example. He quotes from a. uh, a superior a United States Supreme Court chief and from, 19, from the 1890 to 1953. And this is the quote. His name was Frederick Moore Vinson. He says, Nothing is more certain in modern society than the principle that there are no absolutes. 
Can you think? Can, can you imagine that? Where as us as Christians who study the Word of God and we base the things that we say and we do on the truth of God's Word, right? We we stand on that. That's our foundation. But here is this man who is in this place of position, and he's saying that the only assurance or confidence that we can have is the fact that there is no absolutes. There's nothing, there's no base to, um, there's no foundation to base any of their ideologies, any of their views, any of their concepts. So basically, we know that that would always be constantly shifting and changing, like I mentioned earlier. So he says, in this sense, we see how the new sociological law has moved away from the base of the creator is giving people the inalienable right, thus also was moving away from the Constitution. So basically, they were wanting to take out that idea or that view. So we knew that God would be, he would be ultimately supreme and that the rights that we received as a people would come from him. But now they're trying to remove that, which if we remember what we talked about in chapter 2, in chapter 2 it said that the founding fathers, those who founded the United States, also held to that worldview. It's saying now that's something that is little by little shifting. That's something that is changing. And so he, um, he quotes William Bentley Ball. And I like, the, um, I like the quote that he gives here, and I actually want to read it because it gives us a good picture of, an idea of what is happening. And he says, I propose that secularism militates against religious liberty. Basically means to, to shut it out, to prevent, to prevent it from taking place, right? Little by little to do away with it. He says, uh, militates against religious liberty and indeed against personal freedoms generally for two reasons. The first is that the familiar fact that secularism does not recognize the existence of the higher law, which is referring to God, the creator, who establishes those laws and those rights. Second, because that being so, based on the fact that it does not recognize a higher power, secularism tends to towards decisions based on pragmatic public Policy of the moment in inevitability tends to resist the submitting of those policies to the higher criteria of a constitution. So think about that. Whereas before we would have, we would have sought our moral view and our standard on what God has declared as being right, and say now they are doing away with that because these people who are coming together to make the decisions in law for us, they no longer see that higher law. They no longer hold to that view. And then in closing out his quote, he says, fundamentally, in relation to personal liberty, the Constitution was aimed at restraint of the state. Today, in case after case relating to religious liberty, we encounter the bizarre presumption that it is the other way around, that the state is justified in whatever action that it takes, and that religion bears a great burden of proof to overcome that presumption. It is our job as Christian lawyers to destroy that presumption at every turn. So think about that. What is it saying there? It's saying that at one point where we would have been able to look at what was happening in regards to religious liberty, and we would have been able to side on the side of what God had established as being right and true, he's saying that is now being, it is now taking an opposite turn. So now those who are um, proponents of religious liberty and freedoms, they're having to fight to overturn what the state is saying is, something, is true and right. So it took an opposite shift. So now, now the people are no longer just looking at, well, this is something that was established as right in the sight of God, and so we're going to hold that as true, and we're going to uphold that and, and maintain that. No. Now with the decision that the state makes, they're gonna, their preposition is that they're right, 
And if the Christian lawyer decides in that sense to argue with what they're trying to declare or propagate as truth, they have to come up with the defense and a, and a reason why it should be turned around. And so that was something that wasn't happening before. And that's something that's happening now. And so um, this reminds me of what we covered in chapter two. In chapter two, we heard of the terms uh, lex rex, which referred to law is king. And then he gave an example of how that was different from rex lex, which is king is law. So under the idea of lex rex, that law is king, he said even those who were in the higher power, those who had authority, they themselves had to submit to the law. They couldn't just come together and become a law in themselves, right? So now we see how that, that idea of lex rex has begun to shift, even in this idea, right? Because we're seeing that society is the one who's coming together, and a group of people are making a decision for us based on what is happening in the moment. And that's kind of like if we really if we really stop and think about where we are today as a people and how far we have come from where we were, we see how gradually these things started to happen. And what Schaefer starts to ask in this chapter, he he does it throughout the chapter. He says, where were the Christian lawyers? Where were the Christian theologians? How come nobody began to sound the trumpet? Right. And he goes he goes on to say that even those the theologians who began to see this stuff happening, he said this happened over an 80 year span. And he said it began to take it began to become more aggressive over the last 40 years. He said, but even those theologians who began to see this happening, they were seeing it in bits and pieces. And one of the examples that he referred to was the issue of abortion. But he says now because they started to introduce this materialistic worldview, right? He says that they began to um, they, they began to adapt their view of where modern science came from in that sense. And so people were propagating that even abortion was a good and healthy cause for the people. And it says that Christians would remain silent. But it says they were liberal theologians who were given a sphere of influence that were able to teach and to promote their views. And it says, but they began to rub shoulders with the humanists. And so even they began to take on some of these ideologies and views. And again, so he asked, where where are the Christian lawyers? Where are the theologians? So he talks about that there was this balance, right? He says, there was a balance that came from the Judeo-Christian consensus. He says, it gave us as a people greater freedoms that the world has never known. But it also contained freedoms so that they did not pound society into pieces. So think about that. Even though it would give us as a people religious freedoms that we can exercise our rights and our beliefs and our views... It did so in the sense where we ourselves didn't become as tyrants, that we would go against society and begin to pound society into pieces and to dismantle it. It kind of allowed us to to pave the way for for common grace, right, to allow God to work in his people. He says this is the balance that the materialistic concept of reality has destroyed. So it didn't just begin to do away with it. He said it actually destroyed it completely. And now based on this sociological law, that balance is no longer there. And one of the examples that Schaefer gave so we could see how that began to take place, he quoted this, um, this man named Will Durant. And there was a quote that was published in 1977 in the Humanist magazine. Right. And this is what the quote says. He says, moreover, we shall find it no easy task to mold a natural ethic strong enough to maintain moral restraint and social order without the support of supernatural consolations, hopes and fears. 
So they, they, they had this idea that they could themselves keep society balanced, keep society whole, keep society morally right, and to remove any type of supernatural view or uh, influence or idea, and that they would take that away. And they, they believed that that was something that could be done. And again, so he goes on, Schaefer goes on, and he says, as we're, as we're seeing this happen, he asked the question again, where were those sounding the trumpet? And what I like what he says at the very end, he says, you know, ultimately, we can blame shift, right? He goes, we could pass on the responsibility. That way it's spread out and we're not just pointing the finger at one particular person or individual. He goes, but what good, what good is that going to do? So he goes on to say, he goes, that doesn't really help us at all. He says, in order for us to move forward, in order for us to make a change, we must come to understand these things that are happening before us. He said, not just in bits and pieces, not just in like the example he gave of the case of abortion, right? He says, we must see these things in totality. He said that there are two totally different entities and that they are opposed to each other. Right. He says, and based on where we stand as a people and which of those entities that we rest in, it, whether it is the materialistic energy shaped by impersonal chance or is it by the living God and creator. So he says, based on one of those two entities, whichever one we esteem and we hold to, ultimately, that is where we would end up as a people. And so the challenge for us as a church, right, is what he said here is that we would come to understand these things totally, which um, over the years, in my experience, I've been to many different Reformed churches and even rubbed shoulders with um, Reformed theologians and, and guys who are out there doing the work. And to be honest, this is the, the first time that I've been at a church that really focuses on this view for us to uphold as a Christian, not just in not just in this, this setting in the church, but also in society at large. That as a people, wherever it is that we're at, whatever sphere of influence God has given us, that we would continue to maintain this view, whether that means how we raise our children, that that means how we, we function in our workplace, how we uh, influence the community at large, all of those different things. It's just, it's just, to me, this is something that I've seen hasn't been touched on. In most of the churches that I've been a part of, this is something they don't even bring up. So when I read this and I hear what Schaefer is saying, how is it that the, the trumpet wasn't blown? How was it that no one sounded the whistle? I've seen it firsthand. I've, I've witnessed it and experienced it. Firsthand. So the fact that we are part of a church that holds to this idea and this view and we actually teach it to our people, it is something that is truly a blessing. And I believe even if it starts here, right, organically within this context, each and every one of us have the ability to take these thoughts and these views and to begin to share them with those around us in hopes that we would reach the, the Christians, those who, who have influence, to be able to promote the same message. Amen? Does, does, uh, does anybody have any questions, any thoughts, anything that you guys would like to bring up based on what we covered here this morning? Christian Yes. Yeah. Inconsistencies in their own messaging, so we have to be really wise when we begin to speak about 
what our role is in society and not just give up our place and say, well, let's just focus on spiritual things. Because there's no such thing as non-spiritual things to be Christian. So the civic world, the Christian world, our home, everything is under the banner of Christ. So let's just always keep that at the forefront of our mind that there's no such thing as non-spiritual things in the life of the Christian. Amen. That's, that's why I like that part where he says that if we want to move forward, if we desire change, we're not just going to understand these things in like bits and pieces, right? He says we have to understand it totally, which means it's going to take work to, to be able to understand those things and see them as they're happening in front of us. Amen? Any other, any other questions? Uh, the change uh, culture, so they started 40 years ago? He was saying that it's happened within a, an 80-year span, but he said it became more aggressive over the last 40 years. Okay. So there's a, a great uh, historical document on how education in, in 1925 is called, and I don't know if you know of it, um, I just learned of it recently, but it's called the Skokomping Trial. Um, but basically it's a high school um, located in in Tennessee, it was an argument between Charles uh, Darwin and Christianity and the school education influence. And when the trial came about, it was basically between a high school teacher and a football coach. And they were going back and forth on what should be included in the um, educational, um, I don't know, for lack of better words, the canon of what they're to learn in high school. In curriculum, thank you. And so, they were, there was this back and forth um, argument at the state level of what could be included and what shouldn't. It's basically evolution versus Christianity. And so because with that Christian, um, not the coach, but the teacher, he wasn't ready for defending his faith. In that, he, he, he was almost seen as a simpleton. Like he didn't understand where he was coming from, he didn't have good defense. So the state accepted this, the, this, this doctrine of Darwinism in, in that state level and then it influenced in other states. So it was a gradual growth within the educational system is what we're seeing now. And just from personal experience, my daughter went to public school all her life. Although it was somewhat in a Christian home, the doctrine of false religions and Darwinism and about evolution um, changed her philosophy and way of life and worldview. So now I'm combating the facts. So um, I just pray the Lord that um, a lot of families are now looking at the homeschool so they could um, influence the next generations. Although now, yes, we should be influencing our kids for work, family, etc. It's really our the education of our little ones that need to bring them up in a solid foundation of faith. But I don't know if that was already spoken because I came in too late. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but look yeah. into it. It's a really great um, there's video and a documentation on that um, monkey trial, but it's really cool. All right. Amen. Another great resource. Amen. Let's go ahead and close out in prayer. Lord, we just um, we just thank you once again for just the, the care that you have for us as your people, that you would even bring these things to just to the forefront of our minds, Lord, that we can just be conscious of what's going on around us, Lord, that you that you ultimately desire for us, Father God, to, to be set apart and to ultimately to manifest your glory in society, Father God. And so we, we thank you that we, we have these resources that we can just glean from and that we can grow and that we can just uh, teach each other, Father God. I pray that we would be bold as your people to take a stand, Lord, and, and uh, that we wouldn't just overlook these things, Father God, that they that they wouldn't be something that doesn't matter to us, Lord, but that we would truly lay them to heart, Father God, and that we would desire to, to exalt your name in every spirit and influence of our life, Father God, and ultimately, Lord, that we would bring about your glory, and we give you praise, honor, and glory in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen.